Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dimension Society, a wake-up call might be an appropriate title for a speech at five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, um, but it doesn't concern you because I've been observing you. Uh, it's a wake-up call for the society at large uh, that can contribute to help uh, to tackle stigmatization on Alzheimer. And the focus to the general public is uh, what I'm going to uh, present in this speech. The symptoms of dementia are highly stigmatizing. They influence our view on the people with Alzheimer, they color our feelings, and they conditions the way we are dealing with those people. And it's fair to say that the stigma and the social representation of Alzheimer is a part of the illness. Um, it builds the social reality uh, of the people with dementia and the carers. It conditions the treatment. There is a whole set of literature uh, indicating that stigma, uh, the stigmatization of Alzheimer influences the timely diagnosis, uh, both by health professionals and their and, uh, family carers. To the, everybody can help to combat stigmatization. From time to time, we might feel unequipped, not armed to fight against dementia. We see it as a huge challenge. But the good news is that we all can help to live well with dementia, to quote the English national strategy, or that we all can contribute to broadening the dementia debate, to quote a new book by Ruth Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor, uh, broadening the dementia debate. The bad news is that it probably will take efforts from all of us to do so. I will present four initiatives where maybe not the most obvious stakeholders can contribute to improving the quality of life of people with dementia. Uh, journalists, uh, lawyers, uh, the public at large. I will talk, give a brief overview of four initiatives. One goes on new ways of communicating, not communicating with people with dementia, but communicating on dementia as such to tackle the stigmatization. I will briefly mention a community perspective sorry, that we all can develop to reduce the social uh, exclusion of people with dementia and their carers. I will briefly talk about a rights-based approach to protect and empower the patients and their family. And I will last mention some initiatives on advanced care planning to empower the patient who might at time not be a patient yet to keep control of important decisions regarding his future life. Many of the initiatives I will present are linked to work of the King Baudouin Foundation, and of course I'm fully aware that other organizations have a much longer track record uh, in developing them, but of course these are the initiatives I know best. A couple of words about my organization. The King Baudouin Foundation is an independent public benefit foundation based in Brussels. We work at local level, regional, national, European, and international level. We have a consistent set of activities on dementia since 2006. And the first uh, deliverable we had was an action plan, a non-official one, because we're not a government institution for Belgium. We published it in 2008. The good news is that the Flemish government, the Flemish health minister, presented a national or regional, I must say, dementia strategy last week. So that's some one you can add on your, on your slide, Heike. Um, which has been largely influenced by this action plan we presented two years ago. And soon also the Walloon Minister for Health will present uh, her strategy, and I'm confident that also there we will certainly recognize the work we have been doing so far. Our uh, activities for the last year and the following year have to do with communication, with legal aspects, with dementia-friendly municipalities, advanced care planning. We organize, uh, upon request of the Belgian Ministry of Health, a high-level conference on dementia, uh, which will be organized by the Belgian Presidency uh, in the month of November. Uh, we are the Belgian partner in the joint action, Anthony already mentioned, 
and we also uh, initiated a European Foundations initiative on dementia, which I will briefly mention later. Everybody in this room, being a researcher, member of a patient organization, will probably communicate on Alzheimer to the public at large sooner or later. Um, the way people with Alzheimer are presented in the media are often very negative, uh, dramatic. And we want to see whether we can, by being honest, we can give, deliver more hopeful messages to the outside world. That's why we commissioned research to Professor Van Gorp at the University of Leuven, and he analyzed um, what is called frames to represent, or frames in which dementia is represented in newspapers, in novels, in movies, in documentaries. And he had more than 2,000 sources in many European languages. What are frames? Frames are metaphors, phrases, images, uh, stereotypes, but they're not neutral. They keep intrinsically and implicitly a message, a message which is interpreted by the reader or the viewer. And this matches, message uh, defines the problem, uh, gives all, also a moral judgment of what we see or what we read, and suggests solutions or the lack of potential solutions. In his analysis, and I will not present it now because uh, the premiere will be at a high-level conference, um, in his analysis, analysis uh, Van Gorp found six dominant frames, I will just give some illustrations soon, in which we often represent uh, Alzheimer. But he also found more, six counter frames, which offer much more perspective and hope for the people. And what we are doing now after this analysis, analysis is testing with a panel of 1,000 participants in Belgium the effectiveness of these counterframes. Do people understand them? Do they see that they provide solutions? Do they give them hope? Just a couple of illustrations on what frames can be. The first, the lady in the uh, left upper corner, uh, dualism between body and mind. That often gives sort of goes uh, together with words as a black box, an empty shell, there's nothing. There's, there's a hole in the brain. The second one, right corner, infantilization. People with dementia as being childish, the reversed role between parents and children. Um, uh, left corner, downside, Alzheimer as the plague, something, a tremendous epidemic, um, without any hope. Right, uh, right corner down, uh, dementia as a, as a monster, a companion, an, an, a nasty companion uh, you don't want, but he's there. All these images, which so come often, even in well-intended communication, um, don't provide us with a lot of hope for solution. So if we want to develop new ways of communicating, we need to define our values. George Lakoff, he's sort of the, the guru on framing, he's a cognit cognitive linguist from the United States, very active in the, in the Democrat Party. He says, know your values and frame the debate. So what are the values we want to communicate? You know them. We want to discuss all aspects of the disease and all the related emotions. We should not reduce the disease to its latest phase. We have to strengthen or stress the autonomy and the dignity of the person, the personhood, and even broader than that, again referring to uh, Bartlett and O'Connor, the citizenship, the rights of the patient. We want empowerment and social inclusion. All this research and recommendations will be discussed at workshops with people who will, um, who will communicate, or who, whose task is to communicate on dementia. In Belgium first, but through the network of European foundations, we will also organize workshops uh, in other EU countries. Second type of initiative to tackle social inclusion and stigmatization. It's a community approach. My colleague Saida Sakali has presented it yesterday at one session, so I will be very brief on this one. Um, 
Social exclusion is often experienced by patients and carers. Um, this, the local community can do a lot to support them. From Germany, we know the Demenzfreundliche Kommune, uh, initiated by Action Demenz and the Robert Bosch Stiftung. Uh, we copy that in Belgium. It's called Commune Alzheimer Admi. Um, and we work together in close partnership uh, with, to make the effort more sustainable with the associations of Belgium cities and municipalities. And there's also going to be a European approach to this. EFID is the first time I've <laughs> put it on a slide, is the European Foundations Initiative on Dementia. A um, couple of foundations, uh, Atlantic Philanthropies from Ireland, Fondation uh, Midric Alzheimer from France, the Robert Bosch Stiftung from Germany, the Calouste Golik Benkian Foundation from uh, Portugal, and the King Baudouin Foundation's joint forces to spread the model of the dementia-friendly communities in other European countries. Financial resources are still limited, uh, so we start with an award scheme, but we also are looking for partners who want to spread information uh, to local communities that this is existing and that uh, to raise the awareness of the concept of dementia-friendly communities. What do these com uh, dementia-friendly communities do? They develop projects who foster par that foster participation in the local community, promote interaction between patients, their carers, and other members of the community, and give a voice to patients and their carers to be heard in the local community. Two examples, one from a local police organization in uh, five municipalities on dementia, training of police agents, for instance, and uh, another one, uh, the city of Bruges, who launched uh, a large partnership of different types of organizations to make Bruges more dementia friendly. Uh, and one of the initiatives is that they will organize uh, trainings for shopkeepers, pub holders, etc., uh, to deal with patients with dementia. Third type of initiative that goes beyond the usual stakeholders. Legal actors, at least in Belgium, are often not very well informed about the spe specific characteristics of people with dementia. Notaries, judges, attorneys. Um, we made an assessment of all laws that are relevant for people with dementia and which can have an influence of the quality of life. Often if these legal actors have to make an assessment of the competences of the remaining competences of people with dementia, it's sort of a black or white. They have all competences or they have none, while we all know that is, of course, often not the case. Um, we will uh, publish two reports, one for legal actors, to explain them much more in detail the link between the legal provisions and the specific, specific characteristics of dementia, and another one together with the National Federation of Notaries um, for the general public. And last and maybe somewhat unexpected here is advanced care planning. Alzheimer Europe has uh, uh, presented a position paper encouraging uh, advanced care planning. You know what advanced care planning is about. It's consultations, a dialogue between patients, their nearest and dearest, and healthcare providers uh, in anticipation of a situation where patients might be unable to take decisions one day. Often it's uh, um, reduced in a certain way to the writing of an advanced directive of, or a living will, but it can be or it should be much broader. I and mean, ideally, we start before we have first symptoms of cognitive, cognitive impairment, even before we know we might be a patient. And that's interesting because that might mean that advanced care planning might be something we all have to think about, uh, not only when we get in a situation of a certain disease. The Foundation commissioned an overview of all scientific knowledge at the end of life care research group at the Free University of Brussels. But maybe more original, we organized a whole set of focus groups, I think 14 or 15, with, citizens, with ordinary citizens, with healthcare providers, with uh, attorneys, with nurses, etc., etc., um, on 
to, to get a better insight in what is their people understanding or knowledge on advanced care planning, despite a lot of investments by, for instance, palliative care organizations in promoting the concept. Well, we found out that the ignorance on advanced care planning is still enormous, but people when first confronted with it are highly interested. Uh, they see it as a clear method that can empower elderly people, that strengthen respect for their autonomy and dignity, and that can reduce at least the end of life taboo. An interesting, and um, it's sort of, we still have to find out what we're gonna do with it, is that citizens prefer a much broader perspective than healthcare providers in this. They think of something like, I would call, thought age planning. And we have the, the feeling now that this idea of a broad concept of advanced, of advanced care planning might be something where we, not specially uh, patient organizations dealing with dementia, but all types of organizations dealing with elderly persons might be interested to promote, again, to reduce the taboo and to reduce stigmatization. A wake-up call to go beyond the patient, to see the person and to see the person in relation with his community and with his rights, to see the social citizen. That's what we want to do and where we want to make a modest contribution. We all can help to reframe dementia by communicating in a different way. We can all support and take part in community-based initiatives that foster social inclusion of patients and their carers. We can all contribute to raise the awareness on legal aspects and on the rights of people with dementia. And we can all, if we want to, reflect upon our own old age and tail a dialogue with people we care. So we can all contribute to a dementia-friendly society. Thank you.